What's up, YouTube? Prof Sales coming at you with a video about having a job and reselling. So welcome to the channel. This is a live show, so there'll be people in the chat. But if you're watching this after the show is done, feel free to leave me a comment or question. And most importantly, hit the like button if you're enjoying the show. Um, I'll give a few minutes for everyone to kind of filter into the chat and so on. And um, just want to share with you guys some stuff after my first week of being back in the workforce. Man, that sounds so weird to say. I actually, um, for those of you who don't know, I started a part-time job with Amazon, a seasonal position, which I'm not sure exactly how long the season is. And I didn't really get a specific answer on that, but I'm guessing it's sometime up in December, maybe January. And I don't know if it'll last beyond that or if I'll continue doing it past that. But I thought after this first week, I had some uh, epiphanies is not the right word. I guess I have some thoughts about working and reselling at the same time because, to be perfectly honest, I haven't worked a job and been a reseller not really ever. Um, so this is really my first experience with it. I kind of jumped right into um, reselling back several years ago, and I didn't have a job fallback at the time. It was just, hey, go figure it out. So, and, I, and I'll talk about the struggles of that in a different video and how challenging that is, but that's not really the focus of the video today. So I want to talk to you with you guys about Probably a question that a lot of you have out there, and I know I still have this question to some degree, and the question goes like this. I have a job, and I want to go resell to earn extra income, make a few bucks, transition away from my full-time job, maybe do reselling full-time. That might be one scenario. Or you may already be a full-time reseller. Let's say that's your main gig. And you're trying to decide if you want to go take maybe a part-time job, like in my case, to make extra income, bring in um, extra money for cap for sourcing, you know, paying bills, wh whatever you're going to do it for. Um, and I think, I think a lot of people. I don't have a number on this, but my guess is an awful lot of people out there, at the sound of my voice, have you know, thought about becoming full-time as a reseller or maybe going back to being a part-time employee for somebody for various reasons. And this is not a video where there's any judgment. Um, I don't think there's really a, a way to say what's right for everybody in every case because everybody's situation is a little bit different. Some people's are drastically different from mine, for instance, and that would, you know, obviously make their decisions a little bit more uh, different than mine, but <clears throat> I think there's a few things you need to think about whether you're reselling and you have a job or, or whether you're reselling and you want to get a job or whether you have a job and you want to resell. It really works in either direction. I think the first question, and this is the one that, you know, I think this is the one that gets lost in the process. The first question you need to ask yourself is, what is your focus? Is your, is your, are, what goal are you focusing on? Are you going to, do you want to be someone who's, on, who's an entrepreneur, who's self-employed, who has maybe one main hustle, or maybe you have a bunch of side gigs to make the ends meet, but you want to be, you know, self-employed, or are you okay with being a part-time seller and then having a part-time job because maybe it's it's about you know the finances it's about revenue it's about those things i think you need to figure that out before you decide if you're going to take a job part-time or not or continue or reselling if you're already working a job and the reason i say that is because and i don't know that you'll know the answer to that until you kind of jump into one or the other but the reason i say that is you if you don't have sort of a, a goal in the distance that you're aiming for, 
you run the risk of just getting so caught up in the day-to-day minutia of go buy some stuff, list it, sell it, re- rinse and repeat, go to my job, put in my hours, get a paycheck, rinse and repeat. And all of a sudden more and more time passes by and you realize you're not really going anywhere. You're sort of stuck in neutral. Maybe you're making the, you're, you're paying the bills, you're making ends meet, but you don't really know what your long-term focus is. And it's because I have been guilty of that mm, kind of all my life, um, <laughs> full disclosure. And the reason I say that is because it's so hard sometimes if you start thinking about your life in terms of bills, in terms of financial expectations or financial obligations. If you only think about your life that way, then you run the risk of just doing what it takes to get those things met. And there's no room for you to thrive. There's no room for you to build a life that you really want for yourself. And I think the reason most of us got into a career or reselling or whatever else it is you're doing to make income, I think the reason most of us do that is because we have this idea of a life we want to lead, right? We want to do these things. We want to have this ability, these freedoms. Somewhere along the way, for a lot of us, that gets muddled. And we realize that, well, that's great and all, but I got a credit card payment. You know, my mortgage is due. Um, My kids are going to college. I need to put away money. You know, it becomes more about what the, like the money just becomes this thing you have to get because you have these people who want it from you. Instead of you saying, no, I want to live this life and I want to do these things. Now, how do I build income around that? We kind of get it backwards. We're all guilty of it at some point in our life, most of us. And so I say you need to focus on what is your kind of your overall objective here? Because if you just want to pay bills and make ends meet, then there's probably not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of difference between these two paths to that, right? You can resell, make make a few bucks. You can work a job, make a few bucks, and that's that. Um, so think about the focus is the first thing that I wrote down. And that kind of ties into like your long-term plan. Because if you don't have a long-term plan, again, you just get caught up in that day-to-day. I'm just existing. I'm surviving. I'm working to eat, <laughs> working to live, living to work. And... And, and you can work to live and live to work in a reselling business, too. Don't get me wrong. It's not just at a regular job. Um, you can be guilty of that, too. And you're just putting in the hours to collect the paycheck, so to speak. And that can be just as frustrating, if not more so, than a job. So keeping your long-term plan and your focus together are very, very important. What, what's sort of the goal? What's the objective of what I'm doing? What am I working towards, not what am I working in? Um, I think one of the things that I've really, I guess I've wrapped my head around this one is money is fungible, guys. Somebody asked me the day about, well, if you're working this part-time job, are you going to take all that money and sink into your business? And I think that's the wrong question to be asking. I think the right question to ask is, okay, I've got on this hand, I've got a bunch of obligations, right? Financial obligations, whatever they are. you got your you know, your housing, maybe your, your food, your, you know, things like that, your utilities, then you got your bills you have. And so you've got these responsibilities to pay over here. And then you got this pot of money over here and you got this pot of money. Some of it's reselling, some of it's um, from your work and so on, but ultimately it all kind of filters into the same pot. Now I know there's tax implications and things like that. I'm not going to go into that part. But I'm saying like the money that you pay yourself out of reselling, whatever that is, maybe it's a dollar, maybe it's $10,000 a month, you know, it doesn't matter. And the money that you make at your job are fungible. They are money in your pocket. You can spend them on whatever you want. So I think if you get too caught up in, well, this money came from my job and this money came from reselling and the two shall never mix. Okay, have separate accounts. That's fine. And that's, that's advisable for other reasons. But in the big scheme of it all, you need to know, am I making it? (laughs) Do I have enough for what my obligations are and what my dreams and goals are to do with this money? 
And that pot is one big pot for all intents and purposes, even though it comes from different sources and maybe you keep it separate. Ultimately, you say, all right, I got to pay $2,000 for the bills this month and I got $2,200 coming in to pay it. Okay. Maybe 1,200 of it's from your job and 1,000 of it's from reselling or, or whatever the numbers are. You've got enough money. You got enough money. So it doesn't really matter that much. I, I think we, if you get caught up in like this came from here and that came from there, I'm not saying that to say that you shouldn't. Um, I'm not saying that saying that you shouldn't like keep track of is your business if you're reselling on the side or your hustle or is it worth it? Are you making money on it? Is it profitable? Is your job worth it? We don't even talk about that in the reselling community, but oh my gosh, that is totally important. Is your job worth it? I hear people say like, I'll do whatever to make a dollar. And I'm like, no, you won't do whatever to make a dollar. There are certain things you wouldn't do. You won't necessarily drive a hundred miles every day to a job to make a, a very small wage. You won't do a job that's killing you physically or mentally forever. I mean, eventually you have to make some changes or it will wreck you in your relationships, in your life. It's not just about making a dollar. It's about what you had to do to make that dollar. So Reselling is the exact same way as a job in that sense. So you have to keep all those things in mind to decide. But money, money really is fungible. It, it really can go wherever you want it to go. It doesn't, it doesn't matter necessarily. Um, and your accountant would tell you this too. Like if you resell and you make a profit, well, that profit flows through to you. Or you can keep some in your company, but you still have to pay yourself a salary, even if you're a corporation. And so the money technically is yours. So do with it what you want. Um, Include it in the in the pot every month to say, I want to, you know, use this money to do this. I got into reselling and I was hoping to make an extra 500 bucks a month because I want to go to Hawaii in a year. If you're making $200 a month, you're not on pat track, right? And you're going to see that $200 profit coming in every month. You know, well, I need to do a little more if I want to make my one year goal. Um, so, but the $200 that you make every month in that example is still yours, whether you take it and go to Hawaii or, you know, you blow it on lottery tickets, it's still yours. So don't get too caught up in where the money comes from ultimately, other than just to, you know, decide if it's really worth it or not to you. Um, Linda says I'm 66 and my reselling business is not doing well. I'll have to go back to work, but it's going to be tough at 66. Yeah, Linda. I mean, Reselling is a tough game. Um, you know, we don't talk about it a lot, and I'm getting a little off topic here, but not that much. Um, we don't talk about it enough in the community, but when you're reselling, you're competing against big, big companies. You're competing as big, big sellers. You're competing as people have advantages over you that if you try to play in their sandbox, you're going to get sand in your eye and go home crying. So, you're usually better off finding niches where you can be successful, things that you can source cheaply or know a lot about or know that will sell for great profit or you have expertise and not try to play a game where, you know, you're it's you're up against competitors who have a huge head start on you, have huge advantages. You got to try to find areas where you can compete. And that is not easy. Um, reselling, I mean, is what every major retailer does. It doesn't carry just its own brand. You know, a grocery store is a reseller, Target, Walmart, Best Buy, Costco. Um, these are all resellers. Uh, furniture stores, a lot of times, are resellers. They sell different furniture lines. I mean, everybody, there's so many resellers out there. So it's a very competitive game. It's very difficult. So don't um, feel bad that you're, you're struggling at it because it is a struggle. Um, before I go on, just a quick reminder, if you guys are enjoying the content, hit the like button down below for me, please. It let's me know and YouTube know I'm doing a good job and I do appreciate it. All right. Uh, the next thing I think you want to think about if you're going to be reselling with a job is one of the benefits of it is you're diversifying your income, your income risk, more importantly, because... I often hear people say they want the safety of a job. And I've said this, you know, a, a normal job, whatever that means. And I've heard this advice many, many times over the last several years. And I think it's not very wise because of this. If you're working, you know, a nine to five job, 
and that's the only source of revenue you have coming in. You have one bullet in the chamber. You have one hand of cards to play. That's it. That's your only. That's your only plan. That's your only fallback. You you are max. You are at a maximum amount of risk because that job could go away. Your hours could be cut. You could be laid off. The benefits could be slashed. Any number you could you could get hurt to where you couldn't do the job. Any number of things could happen to you that can make that job go away. You literally have maximum risk when you have just one job or that's your only source. And a lot of people don't look at it that way, but it is that way. And more importantly, because if you're working for someone else and that's your only source of income, they are in control of your financial destiny because they're the ones making the decisions about what you get paid and what kind of work you have to do and how long you'll be there and what your benefits are. They're in control of it. You are not. So when you go to work uh, for a, a company and then you also resell on the side or any other side hustle, now you're diversifying your income risk. If the job goes away, you still have the reseller income. If the reselling income goes away, you still have the job income. That is actually a much smarter strategy if you can manage it. And it doesn't have to be reselling. It could be anything. You know, you could have some side business where you make and manufacture products and sell it. Maybe you're diversifying into in, uh, income producing properties. Maybe it's the stock market. Maybe it's, you know, you, you buy businesses, any number of things. So I think that you have to realize um, that diversifying your income risk is definitely a big benefit of reselling and having a part time job at the same time or any type of job. And it's just good strategy overall. And a lot of us, we don't, you know, if you're from my generation or older, you probably still heard the, the lie. And it is a lie that, you know, what you should do is go through high school, try to go to college, get an education. You'll get out, get this good job with an employer and work there for 30, 40 years. That does not happen anymore very often. That is not the landscape we are operating in. And now you would be better suited to say, well, I need to do other things in case that job goes away because chances are it will go away. Um, and through no fault of your own, not because you're going to get fired, but just because stuff happens, businesses go under, they make bad decisions. And if I ran a business and you're my employee and it comes down to, I can continue to run the business and support myself and my family, or I can let you go while letting you go, or I keep you and we go under, I'm going to let you go. I mean, that's, the harsh reality of the world because I have to, you know, have, I have to take care of mine and my family first. And that's just the way any business owner is going to look at it. So um, diversify your income risk is a huge advantage of reselling and having a job. Moonshine Fuel says, I think people should have a job and resell. It's not easy for most people to live off the resell. Reselling. Lots of reselling items are seasonal too, so that isn't the difficulty. I agree, Moonshineful. It <clears throat> as someone who did it, who who has been doing it the last few years, it is very difficult. And I have by no means been uh, as successful at it as I wanted to be or as accomplished at it. And I don't really know anybody who is. Um, most of the resellers that I know out there, even the ones that on the surface appear very successful, still have a lot of doubt. They have a lot of anxiety. Um, they have a lot of challenges in their their gig, and <clears throat> they um, they still don't know if they're going to continue doing it or not. And it's probably just the nature of the beast to some degree. Um, to your point, it's reselling is very difficult, and just like any being in business period is difficult. Working a job is difficult. Like it's all difficult. You know, there's nothing easy about any of it. You know, we get lulled into false senses of security or we believe the hype sometimes about a specific opportunity or reselling gig or model or platform or category. And it's mostly just hype because it comes down to, you know, so many factors that are not even your control over whether or not you're successful at it. You can go out and apply yourself in all the right ways and all the right amount and still fall flat on your face. And that's pretty normal. <clears throat> so, you know, keep that in mind. Any of the stuff you that you try is definitely a possibility, which, by the way, if you're a part time reseller and a part time worker. You don't maybe feel the same amount of pressure than if you were just doing one or the other. Right. It goes back to that diversification again. 
Um, Aaron says, do you still get a residual from every gene guy that is sold by others or should we buy it direct from you? I'm not sure what you're asking there, Aaron. Uh, Steve, Steve Rakin and I collaborated on that gene guide, which I, I think there will be a link to that in the description of this video after it's done. And yes, I mean, we both share the profits on that guide. So if you buy it, then I'll see it as well as Steve. So, um, but I don't know, is somebody else selling it? I was unaware of, <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, but um, thanks for the question. I'm not sure if I answered it right. Um, one, of the, <clears throat> one of the most important things when you're, th this one, one of the most important things when you're trying to decide if you want to work somewhere and resell, and I guess it's important no matter what you're doing, right, is time management. Do you have enough time at the right times to do the things that it's going to take to do your job and to, you know, navigate your reselling business? And man, this one is a tricky one because you literally could work any schedule around reselling and make it work. Like reselling could be literally done at any time, even in the dead of night. If you wanted to do online arbitrage, you know, you can do that. Um, you could list at night, you could source in, at night, you could pack and ship things at night. You can do those things during the day and your job is going to have whatever the schedule is, right? Like, you know, you sign up for these hours and that's what they're going to work you. So, <clears throat> What's important about that is, is that depending on how much time you're spending at the job and how much time you're spending reselling, I, I don't know about you guys. Maybe you guys can tell me in the chat or the comments. I don't feel like every hour of the day is equal. Like we all have the same 24 hours, right? And what I mean by they're not all equal is that an hour in this part of the day is sometimes not as productive or useful to me as this part of the day. And I think that goes to everybody has a different way in which or different times of the day when they're more creative, when they're more industrious. Uh, we all have different times of the day. Sometimes when we're more tired, we're not as focused. Um, so it's not as easy. And I see this advice in our community a lot and it drives me nuts. Like, just go out there and hustle hard and put in all these freaking hours and, you know, that'll make it happen. And I'm like, that's not really true. And most people can't or don't do that. Like when you're a 22 year old kid with no children and no husband or wife and no, no ties to an area and no obligations tying you down. Great. Knock yourself out, work 14 hours a day if you want and do it. But most of us, and I dare say most of the people watching this video, do not have that situation. We have a, a much more, a, a much bigger set of complexities to, to navigate in terms of our relationships, in terms of our obligations, in terms of our maybe our work in another place. So not every hour is equal. I find certain times of the day I'm more productive than others. Other times of the day, there's certain times of the day I don't really want to do anything work related. Because I'm not very productive at those times. I'm, I'm, I find it hard to focus. Like, <clears throat> like the very early morning when I first wake up, I don't like to jump into work stuff that often. I will do it occasionally, but it's never great. I usually need like an hour or so after getting up to really get into the swing of it. And it's not because I have enough sleep. I got enough sleep. I don't know. My mind just doesn't work that great. Conversely, I can't work a third shift job. Like I have worked third shift jobs before in my life and they suck. They're the worst. <laughs> I can't go in. I can't go work in like to one or two or three or four o'clock in the morning or something crazy like that. If you can do it, God bless you. I, I can't do it. Um, I will literally fall asleep on the job. I just am not made that way. My body and my mind just have to shut down at nighttime eventually. Um, when I was younger, maybe it was a little easier, but now no way. So I would never take a job working third shift. Um, it just wouldn't work. And I don't try to do reselling stuff, you know, that late at night either for the most part. Because again, if you're tired, you make mistakes. You're not as productive. You're not as efficient, right? 
So not every hour of the day is created equal. So when you're trying to figure out if you want to resell and work a job, you need to think about the schedule of the job because here's why. Let's say, <clears throat> let's say you find a part-time job and it's going to be from 10 to 3, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday through Friday. 20, 20, uh, was it 25 hours a week, let's just say. And you're like, great, I can do my reselling around that. But now let's suppose that you have children that you have to get up in the morning and maybe you have to get them off to school and maybe you don't have them off to school and so until 8.30, even 9 o'clock, depending on the school time. Well, now you don't have any time in the morning really to do too much. And now you go work your job 10 to 3 and you pick up the kids from school at 3 o'clock and you bring them home. And pretty soon it's, you know, it's time for dinner. Maybe your husband or wife is coming home or whatever your situation is, significant other. And now you guys want to spend time together. And before you know it, you look at you look around and it's nine o'clock at night and you haven't done anything reselling wise. Like that part time job and those obligations are going to make it very difficult for you to resell. You would be better off in that example of saying, well, instead of working five days a week, I'm going to work four and I'm going to spend one day a week, that 10 to three slot working on sourcing, listing, prepping, shipping, whatever you need to do. And just get it done that way. Because what ends up happening is, you know, we have all these little time vampires that suck away at our time every day. And it's 10 minutes here and 30 minutes there. Before you know it, like the day is gone. And you're tired, you're beat, you've been going since all the early morning, and now it's, you know, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. And you don't feel like doing this other stuff. Um, I have a friend, Luke, um, who many of you guys know is Endless Entrepreneurs. He used to do videos and resell. He's since moved into other uh, avenues. But when I first met Luke, he was getting up at 4.30 in the morning and working on his reselling. Uh, listing things, prepping, shipping, whatever. And he did that till about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And then he went to work for a full day. That worked for Luke. Luke was, I don't think he was married when I first met him, but he was he was with his fiance, who later became his wife. They didn't have kids. Um, they have people like families, but I think most of their families are not here in, in the Charlotte area. So they didn't have, you know, quite the obligation to see them all the time. Like he had, he had the ability to do that schedule because of that. And it worked for Luke because Luke is a very early morning, early riser. If you flip that around, he said, hey, Luke, uh, spend that three hours at night at 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. He maybe could still do it, but he may not be as productive. He may not be quite as effective. Like that schedule worked for him. But even in that case, after a while, he decided to do different things. Um, and he started outsourcing more of his business and eventually moved away from reselling. So you've got to understand your time management situation. If you're going to resell and have a part-time job, that is critical. That is critical. And, you know, I guess the last thing I would say about this is, is that I said money is fungible, but you also need to plan for the money. Um, you obviously have a plan for, you know, you have bills and responsibilities, right? We all have those, unfortunately. Things we don't really want to spend money on, but we did, or we or we feel we have to. You know, having power and having a roof over our head and food in our stomach, these are nice things. I, I, I don't disagree. But um, ultimately, you're going to have this little extra chunk of money. Well, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? And maybe what you're going to do with it, sorry, Karin's texting me. Um, maybe what you're going to do with it is you're going to, you know, save it for a rainy day. Maybe you are going to take that trip. Maybe you're going to put it back into a business and build the business to something you can do full time. Um, maybe you want to give it to someone. I don't know, but you should have a plan for it because what ends up happening is it sits there in your account and you're looking at it, you're looking at it and something comes up that maybe you want to buy or you want to get or you want to do. And there it is like, oh, I've got the money for it. Oh, that's it's 100 bucks. Well, I can do that. And now it's gone. And then you've got the thing or did the or did whatever it was. And maybe that was what maybe it was OK. But maybe also you realize, you know, I really wish I'd done something different with that. Well, what was your plan to do with it? Um, I think a lot of us jump into it and we don't really have a plan for the money. 
And that goes back to that mindset, well, we just want to make money at it. All right. But again, not every dollar is created equally and produced equally. So what is it going to take for us to produce that dollar? And what are we going to do with it once we produce it? Um, which I guess is pretty good financial advice, period, right? And I'm not, I'm not sitting here saying I'm some great financial guru. I am not. That is clearly not the case. But um, I do think the times in my life where I've come up with a plan for how I'm going to deal with my finances and followed through on that plan have been much more uh, stress-free, not stress-free, less stressful. They've been easier to understand, you know, my purpose and what I was doing and seeing light at the end of a tunnel versus the times when I don't do those things and the money just gets, you know, uh, spent away and you don't even know what you have for it. Um, so I think that's an important part of if you're going to resell the job, you need to have a plan for the money, whatever you're going to do with it. So come up with that. Um, and there's probably other things too you could add to this list. I'm sure if you're going to resell and have a job or if you have a job, and you're going to start reselling. I, I guess I could have called the title of this video either way because either one really works. But what about you guys? I mean, what if, What's been your experience with reselling and having a job? I'm sure some of you in the chat have and some of you watching later. What have been your challenges? What have been your, have there been aha moments where you're like, oh, this is, this makes sense now. Has there been like obstacles that, you know, you just couldn't get over that were just too difficult to, to navigate or you didn't anticipate? Um, and would you, if you're working a job right now and you're reselling, would you recommend that to people for, you know, trying to, all, you know, do some of the things we just mentioned, like diversifying your income, you know, having extra money that's fungible and having a long term financial plan? Um, I can say that now, you know, I the, the job that I took with Amazon and where it is has I had some strategery around it. Um, part of the strategy was around the schedule. It's a, it's a mid afternoon to, to late evening kind of job. That's fine for me. Like I can do that kind of job, you know, at, at those times and be productive. It, those were also times when I wouldn't necessarily be doing things like a video for YouTube or working on, you know, or sourcing things for reselling on Amazon or, or whatever. So I kind of felt like I wasn't really um, I wasn't really interfering with that. You know, it would it would be I could work around it. The other thing, too, is where the job is at on the way to it. I have plenty of sourcing opportunities that I would normally hit anyway. So I can obviously go earlier uh, because it's a mid afternoon shift. I can obviously go earlier and hit those opportunities anytime I want. And it's not really far out of the way. It's not like I'm having to drive an extra amount of time. I'm not burning too much gas. It's, and it makes a lot of sense. I don't, I don't know that everybody out there is going to have like those same opportunities. You're not all going to have the same ability to do that. But I think you should look for that. I think you should try to get that. Like that's worth something. Um, how close it is to you, what's on the way, if that makes sense for your day and what you're, maybe it's not even reselling related. Maybe it's like, all right, well, I drop my kids off at school and this job is, you know, right near there. So that makes sense. Um, you know, or you're picking somebody up from their job afterwards or they, you know, what, whatever. Uh, I definitely think you should try to do that. Like those factors, people, I see people that, I've seen people, I guess I should say, because I don't really know anybody right now. I've seen people at other jobs I've had who complain about things that have nothing. They complain about the job, but they don't really, it's not the job's fault. You know, they complain about where the job is located, for instance, that it's not convenient for them. Why did you take the job? You know, why are, why are you going to take a job that's way far away from you? And then complain about it and act like, well, I didn't realize it would be so far every day. The exact, I thought maybe the building would move. I mean, 
I don't understand that logic. You need to make peace with that. If if a job is in point A and you're over here, way over here in point B, you take the job at point A, you know you're going to have that commute every day that you go to that job. So I don't understand why you get mad about that. That to me seems silly. It's not the job's fault. Or they complain about the pay. Well, they told you what they were going to pay you. Um, so I don't really understand that one either. Like, why would you complain about the pay of a job that you took knowing what it paid? Now, you could complain about the work, maybe, if it was something different than what was described. But I don't know why you complain about the pay, really, because unless the work is significantly different than what was described, it's significantly harder or more time-consuming or difficult, okay, but that's usually not the case. Sometimes people just come in and say, well, it's just it's just not makes enough, and it's, I'm not making enough. I'm like, well, did they tell you what you'd be doing? Yes. Well, is that what you're doing? Yes. Did they tell you what they would pay you? Yes. Is that what they're paying you? Yes. Then shut up. Shut up. You don't have a you don't have a leg to stand on. Like they told you exactly what you're going to be doing, exactly how much they're going to pay you for, it. and then they did that. Your your responsibility has come to is come deliver the work. So, you know, keep that in mind too. If you're going to take some other part time job and it's really sounds difficult to you, it probably will be. You know, I don't know that I would take it like that. Even if it pays well. You know, there's a there's a balance there, but geez, I mean, it, it's a it's an age old question. Would you rather accept a job that's you know pays this, but it's this difficult, or one that pays this, but maybe it's this difficult? You know, you're making a little less, but you're able to accomplish the job, and you're not like totally um, just bombed out every day and tired, and frustrated, and angry, and I mean, and sometimes you don't know till you get there, right? And then it's you, you work the job, and you're like, hmm, this is not quite what I thought. That happens. But a lot of times it's just people, they're just complaining about something they already knew was going to happen um, and that was explained to them. So I don't really know why you would do that. Like, that's just waste of energy. And then you've always got the power of your feet. I don't understand the people who go to jobs and complain about them day after day after day. I mean, I know there's a therapeutic. There's therapeutic parts of that, right? It's like, I get this all out. Like, I don't, now I don't have to take this home to my family. I'm just taking it out on all my coworkers. But if you really are that miserable at it, get a different job. Like, it doesn't make any sense to stay there. Do whatever it takes. Like, life is too short to be somewhere that's just making you miserable. Um, which makes me think either A, they're just serial whiners and complainers, and that's just how they are, or B, they're not really that miserable. They want everybody to think they're miserable. They want sympathy, but they're not really that miserable. They're they're okay with it, really. They just, you know. Um, Luke was a hardworking dude, says Marrakesh. I'm a landscaper part-time. Sometimes it's hard to run eBay, especially right now. I would think this time of year, Marrakesh, you have a lot of work as a landscaper, right? I'm guessing in the fall. I mean, that's when a lot of stuff is, is done and people make some changes to their their um their landscapes um so yeah i mean so you would need to take that into account with the seasonal type business what is this going to do to me during the seasons how am i going to handle my reselling part of this uh what can i what can i streamline and have in place beforehand and you know there might not be easy answers to those questions but i think you gotta at least try and maybe you already have um but that is always a challenge with when you run a seasonal business like landscaping where it has some peaks. Um, you know, you're going to have less time and energy during those seasons. Um, and then you just have to make adjustments on the other side if you can. Um, <clears throat> UK says, UK Philemon says, uh, I think having a full-time job is safer than selling individual low price Pre-owned clothes. Selling such low ASP items appears incredibly, I'm guessing you meant incredibly difficult to sustain. I agree with you. Um, as someone who sold fairly low-priced pre-owned clothes, although jeans were a little bit higher than, say, like shirts and things like that, um, it is difficult. And I would agree that doing that full-time Doing that model full-time for most people is going to require help. 
I'm not saying there aren't people who can't go out there and sell pre-owned clothing and go through the process of getting it and photographing and listing and, you know, shipping and all that and turn enough volume to make a thriving profit, a thriving wage, shall we say? I don't want to say like just any wage. I mean, that's silly. But to where like they're thriving, like they're getting ahead. They're more than paying the average bills that an average person would have. So they're, they're, you know, they're putting some profit in the bank, they're putting some profit in their pocket. There are probably, there are people out there who can do that as a one man or one woman show. They are few and far between. And the vast majority of those people in my experience that I've seen get burnt out on that model very, very quickly. Um, or they get help. They have somebody else in their family or, or an employee that's helping. Now that's different. If you have an employee that's taken, you know, some piece of that, the product pipeline off of your plate, sure, you can scale that business. You're going to have some extra expense because you're going to be paying the employee, but you can scale that kind of business. But I have yet to meet the, uh, the reseller who, as one individual, can go and do that and do all parts A to Z <clears throat> and do big, big volume. Um, and I guess big, big volume is a, you know, that's a pretty subjective term. But I agree with you. Like, I think that's a great part-time income doing that model. But it's a lot of headaches. It's a lot of time. I don't know that it's a very high wage for the amount of time you put in. I would be surprised if it's much higher than, say, $10 an hour for most people. Um, when you count all the time that you spend on it, all the time you spent sourcing and prepping and shipping and dealing with customers and ordering supplies and traveling to and from, and you know, you, you, you put all that time in, that's a lot of hours to turn even reasonable volume, um, for most people. It just, there's not, you can't get, but so fast is a problem on that method. You can't get, but so fast, so efficient. You can get efficient and there are efficiencies and we found a bunch of them with jeans, for instance, but we got to a point where like, I don't know that you could do this any faster. You can do more of it with more help and more people, more hours, but you can't do it really any faster or efficiently because it can only be done so fast. Um, so not that we were perfect, but I think we reached near the theoretical limits. <clears throat> and I think a lot of pre-owned clothing models are the same way. It's just my opinion. I'm sure somebody will comment and say, well, what about so-and-so? And I'll be like, I don't know. Show me their timesheet for the last two years and then their income and their revenue and their profit, and then we'll talk. But nobody's going to do that. Orbital Search Group. Hi, Prof. One of the challenges is that many of us put too much pressure on our business by taking out too much money. Take out 25% like of possible, profits, if possible, to let it breathe. Oh, you're so right. You're so right, and I'm so guilty of doing that. <clears throat> One of the biggest challenges, if you jump into reselling full-time, is A, everything will cost more than you thought it did. B, profits will not be as high as you thought they were. C, taxes and expenses will be more than you think. And D, you will hit downturns that when you were full-time employed or even part-time employed somewhere else, didn't seem like such a big deal. Now when all your income is tied to that one revenue stream of reselling, they're a big deal and they suck. And what ends up happening from all those things that I just mentioned is your capital and your cash flow really takes a hit. You can, you can, you can, you can drive yourself out of business and reselling multiple ways. You can buy too much inventory and not have it listed. And not have it, or you can buy too much inventory and have it listed and it's not selling fast enough. <clears throat> you can make so little profit on the items that you're selling that it's not really worth it on a time and money scale. Um, you cannot leave yourself money to source for the next week or next month. Guilty of that one. So many ways you can, or, or you can, or you can fail to plan for the taxes and expenses that your business are going to incur. And you end up the day not really making very much or if anything, there's so many ways that, you know, you can screw yourself over in this gig. I don't say that to be negative. I say that to tell you that you need to be cognizant of all these things. If you want to succeed, like jumping in head first, like 
this guy is not necessarily the best way. And had I had to do it over again, I would change some things for sure. But, you know, that's water on the bridge now. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of learning some things from that. But if you, <clears throat> if you jump in full time, all those things will happen to you. It never seems like there's enough capital. Finding product is not usually the item. Finding product that makes sense that you can afford in that moment and it will sell fast enough, that is the issue. That's always an issue. And I don't say it's not out there. I just say you have to connect yourself to it at the right time with the right capital, the right opportunity. And that's hard. Um, and it's hard. It's just hard. So, and that's okay. It should be hard. <clears throat> eBay is part of my end game, says Hoffman Projects. Finishing my nine to five career in three years. Good for you. Uh, after that, it's full time resign to enjoy my time and keep me busy. See, you know, that's a good, see, you have a long term plan. That's perfect. I mean, you have a long term plan. You, you sound like you're going to enjoy my time, which means maybe you're going to spend some of that money for whatever. Um, so, I mean, you have a plan and you have, oh, uh, you've thought about your time management. Now you'll have more time to do it. <coughs> um, if you want uh, to go full time, you're going to have the time to do it because you're going to be retired from your other gig. Uh, you're not diversifying your income risk, but you, if you're retiring, I'm guessing you may have some sort of retirement there. Maybe it's a pension, maybe it's 401k, maybe it's Social Security, maybe it's all the above. So there you go. Um, you know, you have all those things that you can do, um, and you've kind of you've kind of checked off all the boxes. So good for you, Hoffman. That's cool. Aaron says, we've made similar mistakes. Don't beat yourself up. I'm not beating myself up. Um, I'm just trying to be very, I'm trying to be very realistic with the reselling crowd that's out there. Um, because I think there's a lot of people out there at all different levels and all different experiences who don't really have a full grasp of what's going on in this game, their own game. And I don't say that to, to put them down. I just say that we get so busy in the, the minutia and the process of reselling that sometimes we lose sight of the big picture and we lose sight of, you know, is this really making sense or not? Is it getting it done? Is it moving the needle? Obviously, that's not the case for every person, but it's the case for a lot of people, including myself. And, you know, that's why I went and took this part-time gig. I was like, man, I'm just running out of capital every time. It's not selling fast enough to turn it. I've got myself in a little bind here. Well, let's go get a part-time job. You know, I look at it like it was just a, it was just a thing. It was just a necessity. I'm like, all right, this is a necessity. So I'm just going to do it. I'm not 100% happy I had to do it. The job is fine. There's no problem with the job. The job's great. Um, it's just, you know, having to do it, you're kind of like, ah, how did this happen? Well, I let it happen. I did it, you know, so. <clears throat> No one to blame but me. Um, Mark says, I never thought reselling was a full-time income. Plenty of people do and plenty of people have. Um, it's not the majority of people, I think, who get into reselling do it full for full-time income. But sure, I mean, income is income. You know, if you need $5,000 a month to make you whole, what does it matter where it comes from, whether it's a job or reselling or a combination of the two? You know, if it's all from reselling, it's full-time. So, um, you know, what, whatever your, your number is or numbers. So yeah, obviously it can be full time. It's just very difficult for most people to do it with most of the models that are out there. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, it just depends, um, on what you want to do with it. Uh, what I've been doing lately is a lot of things up when I can. I'd rather sell three items in one sale for $75 as opposed to say four items separately for $25 each. Seems to be a better way. Yeah, I agree with that moonshine. Um, obviously, one sale is easier to navigate. Sometimes harder to make, but not necessarily. Depends on the item and, you know, what you're selling. But, you know, any any hack you have like that is great. But you reach a you reach a limit where like the hacks don't work, and they don't make you any more productive. Um, you get it down to like about as efficient as you can get, whether it's selling three items or four items bundled together versus four separate items. 
But ultimately, you still have to get the items. You still got to put up a listing. You still got to deal with the packing and shipping, answer some questions occasionally. You know, I mean, there's only so efficient you can get in this gig. And what every reseller that I've seen that scaled this business to any size, and, you know, we can argue over what that means, but to any size at all, I would say almost, I'll just throw a number out there and say, and you can, we can argue it. but largely most people who are grossing at least 100k will say a year largely most of those people have help um, they have employees they have family members or spouse whoever and there's nothing wrong with that that's great um, you should do that so that's something you need to t take into mind like if you're going to scale this to any size it's more difficult to do it on your own for lots of reasons like two people you guys know this. Like two people aren't just twice as fast. They can be three times as fast as one sometimes. Like there's a multiplication effect, right? Because you don't feel like it's all falling on you then. They catch things that you don't, vice versa. They can do things that you can't. Um, all these things. You're good where they're weak. They're good where you're weak. Those things you don't get when you're alone. So if you want to scale to any size, a reselling gig, it's much easier to do it with some help um, because your efficiencies only get you so far. Um, and I think everybody runs into those real problems, you know, getting sourcing done, listing, shipping, prepping, all those things. And they just take time. They take time. So uh, another person gives you time, gives you another set of hands, another set of eyes. There's no way really around that. And there's nothing wrong with hiring anybody. I'm just saying, just keep that in mind. Uh, um, Mark says, what happened to selling jeans? Mark, where have you been? <laughs> what happened to you on the channel? <laughs> Good Lord, man. I haven't sold on eBay uh, jeans for like probably over a year. Um, so yeah, that's... Um, I did a video about that. Uh, oh gosh, it probably was over a year ago. It's probably back last summer. So um, check that out if you want to get the full scoop. But just eBay in general, we moved off of the platform and you can't sell pre-owned jeans on Amazon. Um, you can sell new jeans, but you can't sell pre-owned jeans. And most new jeans on Amazon are not in a catalog yet. There's an opportunity for you guys if you want to sell new jeans on Amazon. I'm not gonna say it's easy, but it's out there and, you know, they sell for pretty good prices, some of them. there. I do know a few brands that sell in there. I'm keeping those a secret. Actually, I'm not. I just don't sell them. I don't, I don't really ever find the new ones that can be sold on Amazon very easily. There's only a few brands that work and I just never find them at the right prices to even do it. But it would be an easy gig. I mean, I know how to sell jeans. I don't have to take any photos, pack them up in a poly bag and send them to FBA and you're done. Um, but with all things Amazon, there's the devils in the details. So it's not quite that simple, but it wouldn't be a bad business for somebody if they wanted to sell new jeans on Amazon. Um, that is a, I would say that is still a yet to be explored market. There are jeans that are being sold on there and some brands are restricted like Levi's, which really sucks. Um, I'm not sure how you would get approved for Levi's. I think you can, but I don't know how. Um, that might be a tough get to get. But anyway, I digress. Uh, the only way to scale on your own is to sell higher cost items. That's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can do that for sure. Um, it's just one of those things where you've got to be able to find those items. You got to understand those items. And, you know, higher cost items sometimes have a little bit more of an expectation on the buyer's end. So you need to keep that in mind. You know, things need to work and need to be what they represent and even more so somebody spending more money on average. Not in all cases. Sometimes people buy low dollar stuff will complain just as much as anybody. But um, things to keep in mind. But definitely that's a great way to do it. Sadie, what's up? Sadie, Mr. Sadie says, I feel like niching myself is like handcuffing myself. I think being a one person show, the opportunities are wonderful. If you learn multiple categories, the profits are way better for my time. For sure. Um, I don't disagree that there's a lot of opportunities in multiple categories, Mr. Say, but you still run into a time problem. The time to 
study and understand and figure out those categories, what, what works, what sells, what doesn't in some categories can be really tricky, like clothing on Amazon, clothing on Amazon can wreck your capital. And what I mean by that is any clothing item and, and shoes can too, for that matter, which are in the clothing category, but you're only, when you're looking at Keepa data, for instance, you're only seeing the parent ASIN. You're not seeing the child ASINs. You're not seeing what sizes and colors and fits sold the best. So if you just say, hey, I'm going to go buy this pair of Levi's for $10 on clearance and sell it for 60 and it's a size 32 to 30, um, that's probably not going to sell <laughs> very quickly because it's not a common size. But if you look at the parent ASIN, which might be for like, you know, a 34, 32, you're like, great, these sell great, according to Keepa. Well, that size does, but your size doesn't necessarily sell for that. And sometimes they have the size in the title and it is specifically for that one. Um, but that's an example of where if you're not careful, you can really make a lot of bad buys that will wreck your capital and you'll have a lot of product that's not selling. Um, you know, so I think it's just, I think niching into one item can be incredibly profitable or one category. I still believe that. And lots of people who are big, big sellers do that. Um, but you've got to spend the time to learn it. You've got to spend the time to really learn how to source it right, how to, when things sell and what will sell and just like anything else. Um, so, you know, maybe it's worth it. Maybe it isn't. Um, Uh, that's why when you put lots, oh, that's why when you lot things up, it's work. Yeah. Time being a major factor. Moonshine says, yeah, I'm not the best person to talk to, to talk about lotting things together and bundling. I'm not, I'm not good at that at all. Uh, I should be better at it, honestly, because there are opportunities. I've done a little bit of it lately, a little bit. But I need to get better at that because there there are great opportunities for bundles and things, especially on Amazon and eBay too. But for things that don't sell singularly that well or don't make a lot of profit, but you can put together and they're great because you're paying one pick fee. You're paying one fee for them to, to pull it instead of two, which if you sold in two singles. So then it becomes worth it. Um, but, you know, again, you've got to do your research on that one. Clothing's a terrible way to make a living. <laughs> See, that's great. I've seen so many people go full-time, some use clothing to make a decent living. You're almost creating a sweatshop. I don't disagree with that. Uh, uh, hang on, let me change that. I don't disagree with that, Sadie. You're right. That does happen. Um, to do it with clothing, <clears throat> pre-owned clothing, where your margin is great, but your margin in dollars is not so great, you got to move a lot of volume. And I've known some big clothing sellers and pre-owned clothing. You know, we were we were friends with a couple who were we did some videos with them. They were <clears throat> they had I don't know six thousand listings I think at one point, but it was an operation. I mean, you know, it was a lot of work going into that. And they were providing for a couple employees and themselves, but it was a massive struggle. And they were not, in their own words, they were not killing it. You know, they were doing okay. Um, and, you know, they were sourcing tremendous amounts per week. But, you know, you have to, you really have to scale up, you know, with people and processes to do that. I see that now working for Amazon. I mean, they... Like my particular center where I'm working is not that big in the big scheme and is big, but it's not that big in the big scheme of centers. But man, there's a lot of stuff in there that they're using, a lot of expense, a lot of overhead. It is crazy. Um, just, just crazy, crazy amounts of mail totes, for instance, from the USPS, like pallets and pallets of them. It's so amazing to see. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's so many mail totes in there. And they use them. They use them all the time because a lot of the stuff from Amazon gets shipped USPS. So the pallets, those totes, and like, you know, you've got to have those totes available because you use them. I mean, they're not, it's not like they're just sitting there doing nothing. They're being used. Um, but just the scale of having somebody on top of that, the, 
the ability to make sure that, you know, all your employees, um, you know, have gloves to wear. Like we were, we were able to get gloves out of a glove vending machine. No joke. It doesn't cost money unless you use like too many in too short a time. Then I think they would do something maybe. But, but you have to have that. Like you're working with cardboard all day. You would cut your hands to pieces if you were not wearing gloves. You would be a bloody mess by the end of the day. I promise you. And you would be in pain. So um, you got to have gloves for people. So you got to, that's something else to, to, to requisition. You know, it's, you've got to have these things when you start scaling up a business, whatever it is, and you've got to have it in place and you got to have it when you need it and at the, for the right people to use it. And all of a sudden, you know, running like the fun parts that people like about reselling, they like the sourcing. They like the thrill of the hunt. They like selling them. I like selling items personally when the money comes in. Those parts become less important sometimes than all the operational crap. Like all of a sudden now you're dealing with payroll and unemployment insurance and accounting and taxes. And, you know, you're dealing with the operation stuff that's not the actual selling stuff anymore. And that can be a difficult change for a lot of people because some people are really, really good at going out and finding things to sell. Right. They're like, oh, man, this is a great brand. It's a great fit. But what happens when that business owner now has two employees working for him and now the employees need attention? You, you know, your payroll provider is not is down. Um, so and so is not here today. You're going to have to have a write up and a conversation with them. I mean, now those things become part of your every day. And those are much trickier to navigate for a lot of uh, entrepreneurs because you're not used to doing that. You're used to just going out and getting stuff, prep it, ship it, sell it, whatever. And then you add in all those extra layers of complexity and people struggle or fail at it because it's a different skill set. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you want to scale, even to a two person show, dealing with another person is a whole nother set of complexity. It, it has huge advantages. Don't get me wrong, but there are some disadvantages. Um, uh, clothing takes up a lot of room. People are so picky with clothes too. So many body shapes. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't really find it took that much room for me. But that was because we were doing jeans and we had a pretty good inventory system. But in some cases, it can take up a tremendous amount of room. You're right. <laughs> Selling used clothing is a hotbed of endless returns. <laughs> yeah, you will get returns. Uh, and they do eat into your profit. That's just a part of it. There's no, uh, there's nothing I can sell about that. You'd be better off selling old postcards like the auction professor. They take up so little room and much better buyers. <laughs> Who is, who is the Ash professor? Is that is that the guy? Is that Duncan, the guy who always messaged me about, you should be selling those. Is that him too? Or does he know him? He must know him. Uh, I think categories like clothing are a great starting point, but some people don't realize it takes years and years to have a very wide knowledge base to sell, say, vintage and collectibles, for instance. It does. And... You know, say you're bringing up an interesting point because there are people out there who want to sell, be resellers because there's a certain thing they want to sell because they like it. They find it interesting. They are curious about it. They've collected it. They, you know, whatever. And that's what they like to sell. And there's nothing wrong with that. But scaling that business can be very difficult sometimes because, again, as you scale, that's one of your goals, as you scale, now you have to move away somewhat from the thrill of the hunt and being immersed in the product all day to all the operational crap, the behind the scenes stuff that, you know, wasn't there before when it was just you. And so it gets tricky, you know, because you, again, you keep running into that time. You can go, you can go find great stuff, but you're just one person. You have, your time is very finite. We buy time. We buy time from other people. We don't buy our own time because we can't. We've only got the same 24 hours, but we can buy other people's time and that can help us multiply our income. But if it's just you trying to do it, you're going to run, you're always going to run into a time ceiling somewhere along the line. And that's it. Like that's, you've spent as much time as you can realistically spend. You've put in as much energy as you can. And maybe the results are meeting your expectations. Maybe they're not, you know, so that's that's totally up to you. But that even can run the risk of buying yourself a job if you have to put in that time every week, every month, 
to get that return back. Like you're going to be on that hamster wheel forever because you're not scaling. You're just maintaining what you have. There's nothing wrong with that, but just realize you bought yourself a job to a large extent. So there's a balance. I think a lot of us have to strike there. What's up, Lauren? Wrench in the chat. <laughs> I don't know how people can do the low ROI clothing full time, Lauren says. Yeah, I didn't feel like jeans was a low ROI. Um, it was a little bit higher because of just the average selling price. But even with it, it was a grind. It was a grind. And we just reached a point where we realized we don't want to do this. Not to the level that it would take. Uh, to be uh, amazing, amazing results. Nice to see you on YouTube today. I know, right? I'm here in this, the room looks very dark, but it's actually kind of bright outside. It's weird. Uh, well, not super bright. Uh, Moonshine says I should watch The Auction Professor. Maybe I will. I don't know. I don't think I watched him. Um, I've heard of him, but I don't think I watched him. I, uh, He finds high dollar cost items regularly and has tons of info and shows you how, which that's cool. I don't know. That topic will be for another video, <laughs> another day about what you should source and why and what type of reselling gig you should run. Um, but uh, I'll check them out if I get a chance. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you check out the description for helpful links and so on. There's all kinds of crap in there you can buy to help your reselling business. And if you do, it helps support me in this channel. And I really appreciate it. It doesn't cost you anything extra. Um, also, make sure that, you know, you actually hit the like button. And, um, you know, let me know that I'm doing a good job. Because I don't know unless you tell me. All right. Uh, hope you guys have a great rest of your day. I've got to go to work here in a little bit and uh, I'll see you guys soon. Have a good one.